Today's guest cares more about making money than being right. He also manages the Simplify Healthcare ETF that donates all net profits to the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Episode 268 features Mike Taylor, scientist, humanitarian, portfolio manager. Last year was the most bearish I've ever been in my life. I, 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 I I've never, I've never seen a worse setup. Uh, this year is uh, terrible, also, but in different ways. There, it was a, uh, a financial pull down where the cost of capital is going up, and the expectation that's in all the models is for peak margins, peak revenue. I mean, lifetime peak, where they've never done anything like this. Uh, coming off of the 2020-2021 uh, uh, cocaine highs, if you will, of free money plowed into everything and the, you can sell anything at any price, so your margins are sky high. Well, I knew that had to end. It couldn't be replicated ever again, and it probably won't be. Coming into this year, it's a little bit harder uh, on that bearish side, if you want, uh, because now it's going to be the actual falling apart of the economy, and, and that is what's happening. Hey, Inspired Money Maker. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money Podcast, where we share positive perspectives on money so we can make a bigger impact in our communities and in the world. This episode is brought to you by my company, Runnymede Capital Management. I'm a financial advisor and owner at Runnymede. For over three decades, individuals, families, and business owners have hired us to manage their money through full market cycles. That includes taxable accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, and trust accounts. We also help business owners to optimize their 401k retirement plans for their employees. If you have questions about your money or finances, please contact me. Our goal is to be defensive ahead of financial hurricanes, and we officially called a hurricane alert on our April 2022 client conference call. If you want insights into our market outlook, subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks by going to inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. We've got Mike on the show. He's portfolio manager of the Pink Simplify Healthcare ETF and has over two decades of experience managing long, short healthcare equity portfolios at leading hedge funds. He's a scientist and virologist turned analyst and hedge fund portfolio manager. You're about to hear Mike's passion for investing and how being on a hedge fund desk is one of his favorite places to be. In this episode, you'll learn about characteristics that make the best hedge fund portfolio managers and why they have to reinvent themselves many times over. What happened at Silicon Valley Bank and then stay tuned to the end to hear where Mike thinks we are in the market cycle and what one of his biggest positions is right now. Now let's get inspired with Mike Taylor. Mike T, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, just a little intro, I'm Mike Taylor. And uh, I'm again, happy to be here. Uh, I, I ran a hedge fund predominantly in healthcare. Uh, for most of the past 20 years, and most of my tenure was at uh, Millennium and Citadel, which you may know as uh, Big Pod Shops, where we run uh, a wedge of a hedge fund business. And uh, they they tend to be large at Citadel, Millennium, uh, mul in the multi-billion dollar uh, area. And I would share my space. We'd have between seven and 15 healthcare books at each of the shops at the time. And we're all competing against each other. Uh, and, and of course, those people would change uh, because people get fired. They come and go. And I was one of the fortunate ones who was able to stay for my tenure. So thanks again. Mike, it's only more recently that you've been more public, appearing on Twitter in different Twitter spaces. What was it like being in that bubble? Like, what did you learn at your time at Citadel and Millennium? Well, um, it's you, you don't know it until you're there, but it's truly a Darwinian experience where it really is survival of the fittest. Uh, I remember so distinctly uh, at Millennium, and, and it would be the same at Citadel. It's just that I was at Millennium a lot longer, uh, most of my career there. And, uh, and that the, the fail rate, uh, for the portfolio managers there um, was probably about, 
at the time was probably about 20% a year to 25% a year. And so while I was there at my desk, and it's a, a hedge fund desk is different than regular desks. It's not like a desk. It's a, you have these 30 foot long desks that everyone kind of sits on and pods like your team and next to you on the same desk is another team and then another team and then another team. And, and while I was there, uh, the people would come and go, the teams would, new team comes in, that team goes out, this one goes out in and out. And over time, I realized 90% of everyone around me was gone. And it was all new people cycling through. Uh, and there was one instance that was just so bad. This one desk, I thought it was a spot on the desk. It was cursed. It, the, it turned over three times in like three years, you know? And so, um, so the first guy that was there, his name was Bob. And so I just kept calling the PM, whoever came there, Bob, because I knew his shelf life wasn't worth me learning his name. <laughs> so, but that's how it was. And that's a lot of what I learned about, about success, um, that, that it is fragile, it is fickle, and you must do what it takes to hold on to the seat and be in the chair. And it is not given to you, it is earned. Every single day, every single month, it is earned. And if you uh, perform poorly, you don't have business being there. And that's it. And that's what I really learned, a, kind of a vicious meritocracy. And I best think of it like a foxhole where you're, you're in a foxhole, you're with your team, uh, you're shooting all the time, this is what you do, and everyone is trying to shoot you. And that's it. And hopefully you can survive the war. So I know that might be a bit touch depressing, but it's actually really exciting. And I, I really enjoyed the challenge. I loved it. The challenge of being wrong all the time, but hopefully not wrong enough to lose money. And so that's what I really engaged in. Did that turnover weigh on your psyche at all? Or are you just focused on your own performance? Well, over time, that was a good question. Um, over time, you really get to know the characteristics of people who make it and don't make it. Because I've seen so many come and go that uh, my end of my tenure at Millennium, I ended up helping them to salvage good people in bad situations where they, you know, they might be a really bright person. It should be running money, but had a bad run. And I would dissect how they had a bad run, why they had a bad run. And can this individual be salvaged? Can we save the patient in the foxhole? He's been shot three times. Can I turn him around? And, and that was really interesting. I think, I think my efforts there was the first time they ever did it. What were those characteristics? Because it's not just intellect. You're surrounded by really bright people. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, everyone who's there, even the ones that fail, aren't there by accident. They are there because they did go to Princeton or Harvard or all of these wonderful places, and they worked their ass off for many, many years as an analyst and then a PM somewhere, and then Millennium would pick them up. Millennium and Citadel tend to almost exclusively uh, take on people, PMs, that have a, a good track record at a smaller fund. And then they pay them a lot, uh, but it's what they're worth. You know, it's not like you're overpaid. You, you really eat what you kill and bring them in. So you have very accomplished, bright people that are sitting in those chairs, all of them. Um, one characteristic that is consistent is, well, there's two that are very consistent uh, for people that don't make it. And it is uh, continually doubling down on a loser. And, and the issue is they might be right in the end, but they won't make it to find out. And that's always a difficult, you need to have that rope and that understanding that your job is to make money, not be right. So you have these people that come in that are very bright, dedicated, determined. They dig their heels in. They say, no, I'm going to be right. No, I'm going to be right. And then you have to remind yourself, my job isn't to be right. My job is to make money. And that, that is one of the biggest uh, points that you have to get through. Now, the other one 
let's say one that is a very good PM versus a not so good PM. The best PMs within one hour can make their biggest long, their biggest short. Many can't emotionally do that. My top pick, something changed. Uh-oh, I need to make it my biggest short right now. And there are so few people that can do that emotionally because they have this vested interest in getting things right. And again, it goes back to making money or being right. But that's one of the biggest characteristics of success is someone who has the latitude mentally to turn around and break their thesis and just stick it in the toilet and short it. Have you been good at that? Completely reversing the position? Yes. Yeah, that's probably one of the things that emotionally I could do uh, better than others. And, um, and that was actually a big piece of my performance, you know, over the 20 years. It was, uh, when I look back, I had a good short book or a good long book, but it was really my short book that uh, made the difference. I had many, many years that I had a positive return on my long and short book, which is very rare. And that would be the big difference instead of making, you know, 10 or 11% in a given year, which is a good return in that, that model. Uh, and that's unlevered, of course. With leverage, it's a lot more, but we don't see how much leverage is used. We can't see it. We just know we're running one, two, two and a half, three billion dollars. That's what we know. Uh, we don't know how much leverage is in there. But if I can make 11% return on my long and then a 6% return on my short, that's monstrous. That's, that's a huge, that's, that's a great, anything over a 15% year is probably, is definitely top decile. Uh, inside a millennium. Well, you are neutral, right? You're running a neutral equity portfolio. So it seems like the goal was probably high single digits. Oh yeah. No, the, a great, a good year for most is, uh, is seven, eight percent return. Yeah. When you have that long, long position, short position, like that pair, do you have to reverse both of those or that doesn't happen? I rarely, I rarely, uh, you do actually, and you're seeing a lot of that right now happening where books are unwinding, where they can't take the heat right now. Like literally today, I can see it and they're liquidating their books. And so you see shorts getting dragged up and longs getting sold off as they just collapse their pairs. And that ruins trading for everybody. But I, I, I didn't really run it in pairs. I'd run it sort of like I would have a group of stocks versus another group of stocks. Um, and I never really thought to pair one up, like the weighting and so forth perfectly. Um, I know a lot of fellows do that. I just never had comfort with it because I always base sizing on the opportunity um, in the stock and the technical setup for the stock. And that would, in fact, the size of my book was almost entirely determined by my short book. Meaning if I could find big market cap names that were a great short, um, that I get so excited because then I could just get my long book gigantic because I have all these great shorts that are going to work. And I always had difficulty running a book when I didn't have great short ideas. Uh, and I would frequently take my book down. So I'd, I've run my book as small as six, seven hundred million dollars and probably as big as about one point eight. Now, at the time, though, when I was running, that was actually a big book. Now that's not, you know, a billion to a billion five book is good size, but not gigantic. A gigantic book now is over three billion. Now. I'll draw your attention to M2. If you go back to 2015, 2016, last when I was running money, um, the M2 there then versus now is probably 70% higher. So of course the book sizes are that much larger too. So it sounds like you were doing a lot of fundamental research on the, on the companies. When did you add an overlay of paying attention to the cycle? in identifying fund flows coming in and out of healthcare as a defensive sector? Well, I'll tell you the truth in the beginning. So this would be like, oh, eight, 
08 was, I survived 08. I was up 4%. Uh, but I wish I knew a lot more about what I know now because it could have been an awful lot more. But, you know, I, I have a MBA. Of, so, of course, I think I knew how the world worked. You know, I, I know that deposits come into a bank and they lend those deposits out and that's how they make their money, except that that's entirely not how it works at all. It's just that anyone who had an MBA and that's all they had, they didn't know that how the world really worked. And, uh, and I got a crash course in 08 and how the world worked. And I, I actually spent an awful lot of time. I took my book down to uh, zero in 08 or very close to zero as many did. And I started reading history and, and I spent months learning how things work. And that's when my education really started. And that's also when I met uh, Keith McCullough at uh, Hedgeye and he had uh, his fund had blown up like many did, 07, 08. And I met him, he came into the office and I was just starting to figure this out. And I saw his product and I said, this is going to be a really big deal because nobody looks at it like this. And he's right and had a look at it in these different quads, which is a helpful tool. And so I already had my own metrics and how to look at things, but it wasn't as quantified as what he was putting together. And it took him years to put together that product to what it is now. And now it's incredibly uh, well vetted and uh, the details have been pushed in and calculated. And so it's, it's a very helpful product. Um, so, so when I started doing that sort of macro was then, so 08, 09, and then the last piece uh, was around 2010 or so when I started to realize the impact of benchmarking uh, on my names. Uh, and, and I realized that nobody else did this. We were all fundamental bottom-up stock pickers and that's it. But if you can find a fundamental um, idea uh, that it happens to be of interest and meaning in the benchmark, it can have a wildly outsized move because of its position in the ben benchmark that all those benchmarkers who are running an active book in your, that space have to react to it. Whereas when you have a very interesting diamond in the rough that happens to be 20 basis points in the benchmark, you're always stunned because nobody cares. Why isn't anyone looking at this? Why aren't they reacting to my news and my stock? And that's really what I found out is what makes them react and care. And I changed what I did and how I did it. And it, it had a profound impact on my performance. Whereas I might have an awesome idea, but I was very cautious unless it was meaningful in the benchmark because the investors may not care. And frequently that happens, or they may not understand it. They don't put enough time into it to understand it until it hits them like a brick in the face. And so that was, um, that was very good learning to figure that out. And that took years, uh, 10, 11. I didn't start getting actually really good at it until about 2011, 2012. So, and that's one thing about running a book, being a portfolio manager, you have to constantly reinvent yourself over and over and over again. And you got to swivel on your head going around, just try, because you know that whatever style you have and it's working now, it may not work in three months and you're going to have to reinvent yourself and be a different investor. And it's very challenging emotionally, ego, it's it's because we all want to be right all the time. And I think the only way to do it in the world of investing is to realize that whatever you're doing now may not work three months from now. So you have to be prepared to take everything you learned and put it in the closet for next time and relearn something else. It's so fluid. It, 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 it does seem very difficult to um, survive for a long time. Yes, that is the big reason why most don't is because they can't reinvent themselves. Um, and I've had many uh, conversations with the managers who will manage large groups of uh, investors and, and you know, you get a new PM coming on board and they say they're going to do it X, Y, Z way. And then three months in, they totally change the way how they're doing it. And uh, I, I always told they get they'd get upset. Oh, I need to get rid of this guy. He's not doing what he said he's going to do. I said, no, this is what's going to happen is that he's going to reinvent himself five times this year. Let's see if it works. And that's it. And that's really it. Because you, you come in with a plan, but in investing, truly, 
in the hedge fund arena for long investing is different but for a hedge fund you need to have a plan but be amenable to changing it a lot and that's how you survive mike you're still very plugged in especially talking to the smartest guys in the room who worked for you so you hear a lot you talk to these guys every day I do. why did you leave the hedge fund world and now you're running pink simplify healthcare etf well um i don't talk about it a lot uh but i had a medical problem that uh, came about in 16 and um it's an autoimmune condition that was um that uh that put me in a very 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 difficult state for several years and i uh i could not do well, it wasn't clear that I'd ever uh, recover. And uh, the, through the marvel of medicine and blood, sweat, and tears, mostly blood, uh, <laughs> uh, I had a wonderful, meaningful recovery over the past three years. And you got to see that where uh, I became public. And the reason why I wasn't out public before ever is because I wasn't allowed to be. I was essentially owned by my my bosses and I'm not allowed to share what I thought. And so once I came out of my uh, medical issues and I had no strings attached, uh, I thought about what I'd really like to do. And, and I at that time had the latitude to do things, anything. And, and I came up with this where I would help as many people as I can work with my guys to help them be successful and to you know go off and run their own funds and make an awful lot of money and have and enjoy it and then and then uh, this pink uh where i could really give back in a way you know it, it's like i'm a carpenter right this is what i do and i'm making cabinets for charity that's kind of how i look at it and i can make beautiful cabinets for people and they uh, can enjoy the returns of the fund and enjoy hopefully they can listen in and learn something that will help them in their investing so that they can have a better life and so this way i can i can help out science help out breast cancer breast cancer uh, patients and survivors and families um uh, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful uh task and i'm so lucky to do it i gotta pinch myself every day i realize it's work and i don't get paid for it but that's the plan i i don't i don't need that and in fact i'm happier not getting paid for it because you know sometimes when you have a financial um financial rationales around you and pressures and so forth you make choices that are not entirely in the best interest of the fund meaning hey i want to go run a hedge fund or hey i want to pair up uh, with somebody else and divide this thing up and blah 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 and make it really work to my benefit but here it's straight up where it all gets put out to charity for uh, the susan coleman foundation yeah this is super unique i mean 100 percent pro bono etf donating the net profits to the susan g coleman foundation every year how did you come up with that idea and structure well i'd love to take full credit but i have to take none because mike green and um and others at the simplify uh group uh thought this up and they had thought it up with me in mind and approached me and saying would you like to do this uh we could make this work and uh and it was a wonderful idea and i thought about it for about three weeks and said yep Let's do it. And that was it. So, so far, so good. Uh, we're in our early days. Uh, we've only been on for a little over a year. And uh, I look forward to uh, a little more than a decade or two or three or four uh, of doing it. So I'll just keep doing it for as long as I possibly can. Getting through the health issue, how does that change your sort of views on what you want out of life and what money means i mean it seems like uh you come out of it with i got a second chance i can do whatever i want yes that is a great point and i view 
every day, every month as a gift. And, and, and I suppose I should have always looked at it as a gift because it really is. Look, you're a numbers guy. I'm a numbers guy. And life is a numbers game. And there's a lot of events in life that you don't have choices in. These things simply happen to you because numbers and your number is up. And my number was called and I was able to evade it uh, successfully. And, and so everything is borrowed from here. Everything is a gift. And so now I'm Santa. I'm, I'm bringing gifts back. The world has been very good to me and overall quite kind. And so my job is to give it back to my family and my friends and everyone. Because what else am I going to do? So is there a, was there a big shift from, it's like, accumulation to how do I give back? Well, truth be told, I'm still accumulating. <laughs> uh, but I'm just trading my own, my own money. And, uh, but, but, but this way, I'm not beholden to anyone. Right. If I went and did my own hedge fund, uh, people would own me. I'd have to write notes and, and uh, partners, CFOs and compliance and all of these things that own you, pieces of you. And in this respect, right now, nobody owns me. You know, when I, I for instance, I, I speak on Hedgeye often in other programs and I'm I'm a paying member for all this research. Nobody pays me for anything. I don't want to get paid because I don't want to have any string attached to me for anything uh, because I want to be able to say what I think and what I believe should happen and what I think is for the betterment of the people. And and not like I have a political view either. I, I don't. I just might have a view and mostly it's around investing. And, how we can profit the best and what we should do and what, what we should look out for. And so it's, it's, it's sort of a unvarnished, um, view where like, you know, for instance, our good friend, Kathy Wood will go on to CNBC and she'll be pitching the merits of her book. She will always pitch the merits of her book, no matter how bad it is, because she has an incredible bias in there and she's gathering assets to pay herself. So as I'm doing pink, I'm not gathering assets to pay myself. I'm gathering assets so that these individuals can have a great return and give it right back into what I hope is the best part of society. And it's helping those that really need help. And, and that's, and that's one way we're like a Kathy Wood and I are very, very, very different. And that's why I don't, at this point, I don't want to do anything for profit, especially my own profit, because it will obscure my vision. And I do not want that. I want it to be very pure and very crisp and very clear and that I will do the right thing because I have no influences to deter me from doing the right thing. Mike, never have I ever thought of you and Kathy Wood being similar, just FYI. Uh <laughs> So biotech, med tech, gene therapy, this is very much your area of specialty. And these companies need money for R&D. The market conditions already were creating a cash, a cash crunch because they haven't been able to go public. The, the venture capital money, so you know, the venture capitalists are not throwing more money at them. So I wanna ask you with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, what is the impact and outlook? Uh, for Silicon Valley Bank, and for your listeners that may not know, uh, Silicon Valley Bank was a very, very large uh, bank in Canada, California. That, and I'm looking at all the stocks right now, so I'm I'm like literally trading as we talk. It's not pretty today. <laughs> so um, they they uh, they had a uh, they had a problem where they got a lot of hot money in deposits. And it was, it was around a lot around uh, private tech 
companies that were California, let's say, financed. And this was the hot ticket. Silicon Valley Bank was hot. You wanted to do your business with them because all the hottest startups did. And they had the intro, the cap intro. They would give you credit lines against your phantom equity and on and on and on. They really catered to these uh, private tech startup companies. And, and, and that was a huge benefit. And what happened over the past 10 years, uh, while we had an awful lot of quantitative easing, is that uh, a lot of these companies continued to raise more and more and more and more money. And even if they didn't make money, they raised money. You get more clicks, you get more money, more dollars, more investment dollars coming in. And so their deposits swelled and their uh, credit lines swelled. And what they did, as you know, that money comes in. Well, what do they do with that money that comes in? They invest it. They invested it uh, more so than others in uh, mortgage-backed securities. And because it had a really nice, high, juicy yield and they would pocket the difference, just like any other bank where you get 3% on your deposits and they're pocketing 5% on their investments and they keep that 2% spread. Well, the problem was what has happened over the past 18 months is that those tech companies stopped raising money and well, they had to start drawing on that capital in order to finance their operations, what's called the burn. So they wanted to take the deposits out, take the deposits out. Well, this bank had to turn around and sell those mortgage-backed securities. The problem is the value of those securities had dropped substantially. Now, if they held them to maturity, no problem, but they can't hold them to maturity because people need their money back now because they're asking for it and you have to give it to them. It's called a deposit for a reason. And so they started accruing losses very quickly. And the uh, treasury came in and shut them down because they exceeded their sort of minimum capital requirements, actually went way over, and they were an insolvent bank. Uh, now, the problem is with that and the other banks that are running into a very similar problem this minute while we're talking, um, is the... The, the problem is actually going to be around uh, not just the deposits. It appears that's been fixed with a wave of a wand, at least so far. They're going to honor every deposit that was ever done, which is a totally new rule they made up in an overnight. And I don't even know if it's legal that they made up that rule because for anything that is going to be a loss, the government is on the hook and the government paying for it would require an act of Congress. So it it is not clear if it could be legal what they did, but they did it anyway. So it's, you know, their practice has always been to act first and then, um, um, and then uh, apply for uh, redemption or uh, apologies and um, a correction later. So the big problem is going to be the credit lines. So as all of these deposits are switching around, the assets are moving from one bank to the other bank, uh, there were many, many, many credit line handshake, loosey-goosey stuff across the country, uh, especially commercial real estate, which is now beginning to get reshuffled. And I think the, the outcome of this very likely is going to be um, moderated growth expectations for many of these projects, which means they probably have to start firing people so, and, and get smaller. So that's going to be the big impact. And a rising, to a degree, a rising cost of capital for, for businesses, for commercial real estate, uh, for private companies that are cash burners, things like that. Do you think it's more than just the duration mismatch, this asset liability mismatch? I mean, I figured that the FDIC was working very hard over the weekend trying to get TD Bank or RBC to, to take over, but they passed. Is it just yeah. the duration or did they well, see something no, there and they're like, not, no, thank you. That. It's not that. They learned from 2008, you never buy the first fire sale because usually there's more. And if you buy the first, you can't buy the fourth because you're out of money, right? And the really good deal is on the fourth fire sale. Right. So that's what I think is going on so far as finding a buyer. 
And also, if you bought it, you would have to honor all of the contracts that are sitting there, all those lines of credit that may blow up on you, all of that. You have to honor it. That's what you're buying. You can't just rewrite it. Now, if it's liquidated and then you buy the pieces, you don't have to honor those contracts. You're buying a piece of a business. And that's how I think it's going to be, how it's going to be broken up. So you think they're being patient. They can wait and then buy those client relationships and come out of it in a better position. Uh, or buy the pieces they want and don't want instead of buying the whole thing. And that's really, I think, what it is. I want this, don't want that. And, and that's how I think it's going to play. Okay, Mike. So with your family office, with your own money, you can do anything you want. You've been very quick changing positions. I saw, you know, there have been times where you actually went long Bed Bath Beyond. Very short. I did. I but did. <laughs> you did not like Bed Bath Beyond, but you no, actually took a long zero. position and made money. Your timing was good there. No, well, usually what I do if I saw a liquidity event that's going to jack the market and all this these pieces of garbage would would lift, I would and or if I saw a threat of that, I would frequently and I'm short a lot of these and many of them are on my whiteboard over there. Uh, but um but I would, uh, I, I put calls on it. I buy calls 25, 30% out of the money uh, for very little money, you know, no catalyst attached to it, just bang, 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 bang. Because these things would literally move. In the case of Bed Bath & Beyond, I think it went from six to 27 in a month. Uh, you know, just what, you know, crazy. And uh, so that's how I, and it's really protection. I don't expect to make money out of it. I just expect to be able to live another day to short it. Um, and that's, that's really my goal. So, and that's, that's something that I did at uh, Millennium and Citadel. And that was different than what, how others would run money. They frequently didn't think about the outsized event that you couldn't see. Uh, I would frequently do something called a risk reversal uh, an options trade around uh, large shorts that could get taken out, um, even if I didn't have an inkling that they would get taken out. And so what I'd be doing, you know, I and this this happened many times. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Cubist uh, Pharmaceuticals in, I think, the end of 2015. I think that was when it got taken out by Merck. And I had a big short position in it. It was very bearish in it because I thought they were going to lose their intellectual property on their lead drug. And the stock would essentially be down 70%. Uh, but I didn't know what day it would happen in the courts. And I also knew that it was really cheap. So, uh, you know, I didn't think it was going to get acquired. But... What I did was I bought um, calls, 25% out of the money. And I remember explaining it to the desk because when you do it in this kind of size, it was 10,000 calls, you know. When you do it in this kind of size, they want to know what you're up to because they're going to be on the other side of that trade. So I bought uh, calls for uh, about 10,000 calls, 25% out of the money, and then I sold puts. Uh, 25% out of the money, same, same number. And so I'm selling one buying the other. It cost me about nothing to put it on. Uh, and then on top of that, I was short stock of a similar amount, something like that. And I'll never forget in that December, uh, it must have been a week after I put that trade on, not thinking anything, Merck takes it out and buys it. And I thought they were absolutely insane, but I lost six million dollars maybe seven million dollars on that trade and it would have been 20 something or more uh, had i not had that position on to hedge myself out of risk and that's very much what i'm doing with some of these smaller companies like a bed bath and beyond uh, i'll do something like that where i lose some of the downside short because if that stock cubis dropped 25 percent, i'd be capped at a 25 percent gain on that drop and that that's what the being short the puts would do. So I lose some of the upside in that, but it protects my downside if I'm wrong for whatever reason. And that's why I would do that. 
Uh, funny note, though, uh, the day after Merck bought Cubist, uh, literally, this all happened in like a 48 hour period. They buy it. I lose the money. The next day, they lose all their intellectual property in the courts suddenly. And essentially, the company was nearly worthless one day later. But Merck committed to buy them. And it was like, it was one of those terrible things in investing where you're like, I'm right. And I lost a ton of money. <laughs> so, and so there's always a battle between being right and making money. And they are frequently not the same thing. So, um, so that's how I would do it. And there's an example for a real time example from, I believe it was December, 2015. Well, I appreciate some insight into how you view risk, the, the risk to reward and try to manage that actively. It's a full-time job. Even though you, you trade actively and will reverse positions, but at the same time, you're pretty patient because you'll identify like what are three core ideas that you think may play out in the next year or three years. Yes. So talk a little bit about where are we now because things seem so crazy and there's, there's so much uncertainty. What do you see? Like, where are we in the world? And give us some insight. So far now, um, there's, I mean, we're at a, a very difficult crossroads at this, at this spot. Um, stocks are flat out not cheap, not even close to cheap. And, and I'm not a valuation guy. I'm just saying that because a lot of people are, and they will look at those things. And we have full employment, so everything's good. Uh, believe it or not, this is as good as it gets. We have full employment. We have what has been a rising cost of capital that has turned into a mini banking crisis, which is happening right now. Uh, but we have some confounding things that are making the stock market look better than it is. And one of those things is the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling debacle, while people think it's a bad thing, it's actually a really great thing for stocks because the US government is running a deficit, uh, meaning they're spending too much. And it's about 100 to $120 billion a month that they're overspending. And that's balanced out normally by issuing bonds. You have to sell bonds in order to get the money to spend it. So everything is sort of equal in the world where you're issuing debt to spend. And so there's a cost on one side and then the spend on the other. But not when the debt ceiling hits. So the debt ceiling is hit and now the treasury is spending without borrowing. And they're doing that by borrowing from the, they're drawing their cash down, but also borrowing from federal pension funds and sticking an IOU in there. So what it feels like to the stock market is 100 to $120 billion of new liquidity flowing in every month. It feels like quantitative easing. That new money is flooding into the market through the government, but that's the same. It's paychecks to people and so forth, but they're not borrowing in order to have that money. So they're sort of having their cake and eating it too. And that's what it feels like. And that is very, very, very stimulative. It's the equivalent of having a over trillion dollar uh, quantitative easing program. And that's what it feels like every month. And that's what's, in my view, has been net net holding up the stocks for now. Is that why you were very short last year? But I think that you've covered a lot of those positions this year. Yes, um, I am. I'm not as sanguine in my positioning as I was last year. Last year was the most bearish I've ever been in my life. I, 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 I I've never, I've never seen a worse setup. Uh, this year is uh, terrible, also, but in different ways. There, it was a uh, a financial pull down where the cost of capital is going up, and the expectation that's in all the models is for peak margins, peak revenue. I mean, lifetime peak, where they've never done anything like this, uh, coming off of the uh, 2020 2021 uh, uh, cocaine highs, if you will, of free money plowed into everything, and the, you can sell anything at any price, so your margins are sky high. Well, I knew that had to end. It couldn't be 
replicated ever again. And it probably won't be. So that was, to me, that was a, and that's why I was so bearish coming in. It was the worst setup I've ever seen. Coming into this year, it's a little bit harder uh, on that bearish side, if you want, uh, because now it's going to be the actual falling apart of the economy. And, and that is what's happening, but it's frequently slow at first and then quick. And the reason why I say slow at first, one of the metrics that people use in order to evaluate the strength of the economy is credit growth. And credit growth is what you always look at, because if you're borrowing a lot, that means you're, sorry, it means you're super confident. And, and normally that's the case until you run out of money. And then you're borrowing because you have to, but it still looks like you're super confident because you're borrowing more and more and more and it's accelerating. And that's at the point where we are now, where things are deteriorating, but the uh, credit growth is really starting to, to, to lift up. And so it is sending a mixed signal. The exact same thing happened in 07, where everyone thought things were getting better because credit growth was uh, really ramping. But no, it was because people didn't have the money for their daily activity. Now, you can see this in the auto delinquencies and so forth. We have, uh, you know, extremely high, all-time high uh, auto um, defaults and delinquencies, for instance. Um, and, and nobody seems to care. It's not a problem. They ignore it because earnings are still okay. And this is exactly what happened in 072, where everything was okay because earnings were okay. And it's a little bit surprising, but look, these things repeat themselves over and over and over again. So we're sort of at that tail end where everything goes from okay to maybe not so okay. And then they'll say things like, oh, well, it'll be a soft landing, we'll, we'll ease and so forth. And then after that, they'll say, well, it's gonna be a shallow recession. And then they'll say something else. And then they'll say, after you really go down, then they'll say, it's never been a better time to buy. You know? And that's, that's how it goes. So, um, and that's sort of what, how I expect, what I expect to play out. It's just uh, the timing is always a little bit difficult. Uh, but, but with this move and the movement, the, the movement in the credit lines and so forth, um, I think we're very, very close to seeing uh, probably jobless claims start to lift. So as again, we have full employment. It is not difficult when you have full employment to uh, start lifting claims. That's the key variable, right? It sounds like you're still bearish, but you're being patient until you actually see that lift in unemployment. Yes. Yes, because as soon as that starts, that's when all those credits that have been expanding, expanding, expanding start to go bad. Because right now it's fine. Yes. Yes. They stop paying their bills. They stop paying their credit bills. And that's when things go really bad. Uh, but stocks usually don't actually go terribly bad until that actually happens because earnings are okay and uh, management's still bullish. Remember that management at most of the companies uh, have a very, very low visibility. They'll tell you they can predict the whole year and so forth, but that's not true at all. Uh, it, I mean, uh, for instance, last year, last year was a great example where every most of the uh, consumer companies guided to all time lifetime high margins and revenue growth for next year. And literally within 40 days, they were dead wrong, like unbelievably wrong, uniformly across the board on everything. And you say, how you run this company, how could you have gotten, I mean, like almost every CEO. The only guy that got it right was the CEO of Restoration Hardware, said this is gonna be a total disaster. And he was right. <laughs> and I'm not even a consumer guy, I just happen to listen to a lot of calls. And healthcare outperformed because it's a different business, it's not as cyclical. But it was really stunning uh, to see so many companies get it so wildly wrong. And, um, and that's because they don't actually have visibility. I mean, their visibility is, it could be three weeks, that's it. So whenever they're giving guidance at many of these companies, you have to realize that they don't know. Even if they think they know, they don't know. And that's, that's a remarkable point to always keep in mind. Well, we're gonna find out over the next couple of quarters if the E is the incorrect number. 
you know, E could come in much worse than expected. Yeah, uh, I think the thing to really watch now, uh, and you can see it in the, the challenger data for jobs, um, that's, that's the one thing that I'm worried about. And then the, the prelude to that typically is going to be building permits. Yeah, talk about what you're seeing in the commercial real estate, because you're watching that very closely. Yeah, and we talked about this a year ago, uh, and that and that the commercial real estate market is 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 pretty big in the U.S. Uh, it's over twenty trillion dollars, and and the commercial real estate could be, you know, office buildings, retail, brick and mortar. You know, you're strip malling your town. Um, it could be multifamily housing that would be considered commercial real estate, and. There was a lot of money, just like Silicon Valley Bank, uh, that had uh, been flooding in. And a lot of this is being funded. Commercial real estate is actually being funded by you and me and our, our pension funds. Uh, that's a big change in the past decade. It used to be very savvy investors for the most part that did this, but it really became opened up in these wealth products to you and me through our, you know, our brokers. And and it returned like fifteen percent forever. So it seemed and it was like a yield price. story in a it's low a interest story. rate environment originally. Yes, yes. and and even then it, there was a capital return too associated with it. So it wasn't just a yield payoff. It was a it was a total return, and and that was uh, really attractive. Um, so 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 we had a really not sophisticated investor you and me uh like that coming in and pushing to build all this and there and you could think of a dozen wealth products off the top of your head of uh you know entities selling these sort of things to individuals um in a very organized fashion with a sales force and so forth and so these these builders would get these mandated uh funds to build this and this and this and this and they have to put that money to work and that was one of the big problems over the past three years though uh the cost of capital was so low that they could lever up quite a bit and so you'd be looking at financing something to build it or modify it or improve it at 3.7 percent and at the time the prices were so high because there was so much money floating around that you might only be looking for a cap rate or a total return of six and a half percent and so you're looking at a spread between the two that's like two percent two and a half three percent and that's it and that's that's the return that you're actually looking for. Now, you don't have a lot of equity in it. So it's actually a good return uh, return on capital. Most of it is all debt. There isn't a ton of equity in this product. So the actual return to the shareholder, while it's a 3% return on the whole project, well, you might only have 20% equity in the whole thing. So it's a 3% return on 20. So you, know, you multiply it by five, 15% return on that equity portion. And hopefully your listeners can follow that or think about it or draw it out. But that's pretty much how it works out, where they get a 15% return because they're levered up five times in the entity. Now, the problem that happened, a funny thing happened on to the, as we, uh, as we approached uh, this new year, the, the cost of capital went up. And right now those projects have to get financed after you build it at about 9%. Why do they get refinanced? Because you usually get a construction loan of sort uh, that would be uh, for the short term, a uh, two or three year loan to do the project, and then you would convert that into a long term financing. So it's sort of two different loans. You do it, um, you know, to build it, modify it, improve it, purchase it, and then you refi that for the long term. Um, so it's sort of two different loans. And that's really because you need to get a valuation on the modified property when it's done. So you're taking different kind of lenders, one that will lend you to buy and build. And then the other one will say, well, now it's worth this and we'll finance that at this rate. And normally the rates don't move so much, but here they did. And so an enormous number of commercial uh, properties are underwater now as they go to finance after they've bought, built, modified, tried to fill it, 
and the project doesn't work now at 9%, you're underwater. And so we're probably going to have an, an ungodly number of what you would call keys being given back to the banks over the next year. Now, that hasn't started yet. I mean, that's not true. It has started. Uh, it's just that you won't find out about it until the next quarter. And that's what I was actually expecting to happen, not this. Not what has uh, transpired here with our banking problem. This is a this is another potential shoe to drop for the banking sector, so it can get worse. Um, yes, uh, but I don't think I think that this uh, deposit sh problem uh, with the mismatch and duration that we're seeing right now, I think that they're going to quote unquote fix that. Uh, the Fed has just walked in uh, and started a facility. I can read it to you right now. A friend of mine just put it to me. Where is that masked man? I have an awful lot. There we go. But it may be too late for some of these regional banks that are getting really beat up already. Maybe? Um, yeah, it, it very well could be. If their customers have just left in yeah, that. Yeah, they have. And they have, and they can't say no. And so the losses will mount, rack up very, very quickly, and then they may be at an impasse. And the hard part is about that impasse is all, all the sort of uh, credit agreements they have, like, you know, now they can't expand them, they have to shrink them, or they can't honor them, or they go under and they're closed out, you know? So it's, it's, it's disruptive, what it is, disruptive. And that, that's never good in banking. And the after effects of these sort of things usually takes a little time before you get to see that. And stocks don't usually understand that, uh, that there can be repercussions later. They like to react now. So I have a liquidity facility that the Fed uh, adding to bank reserves. And essentially what they're doing is um, buying the mortgage backed securities from the banks. Uh, now, the, at, 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 at par. So they're basically giving them free money. So they're marked here, but we're buying them at par. Uh, we're buying them at, if we hold them to duration, this is what it's worth. And that's what we're giving you. And so it, it, it actually ends up becoming, uh, I believe, a premium uh, where they're swapping it. So I guess what they're doing is they're probably doing something like this where they don't actually buy it. They're swapping it. And they're saying, you can put that to us for the duration at a uh, disc, we'll do some sort of discounted rate back uh, that's appropriate. So you won't get it all, but you'll get most. And then you can use that cash to fulfill your deposit. So it'll, it will reduce the losses that these banks have. Two things happening there. One is that the bank who is supposed to be managing their duration risk, they got a free pass. But two, the treasury can hold the mortgage-backed securities to, to they, the treasury can hold to maturity where the bank couldn't because they have deposits to meet. Yes. And what they can do is what they're probably doing is giving them a sweetheart loan versus that. So their losses, so it's not actually we're giving them money, we're giving them a loan. But now they hold the collateral, the, the treasury, U.S. Treasury, to maturity and in exchange for money. So I think that that, that if I had to guess, because I haven't read the details, that's that's how I'd assume that's done. And I apologize if I'm wrong, um, because I'm just looking at this on my desk right now I'm from a, a good friend of mine named uh, Julian Brigden, who just uh, put this to me and showed me, I got to freaking zoom in on this. So I can see how much liquidity was stuffed into the system. Looks like it's pretty big. Do you view that as stimulative or it's not? It's just sort of a it's net stimulative. zero. Well, oh God. And that's what people ask me, is it stimulative? And I'm like, well, no, because you're only using it if your people want their deposits back. And getting your deposits back isn't really stimulative because you're not adding money to the system. What you're doing is making banks that are insolvent, not insolvent. You're giving people access to their money. Yeah, exactly. So I think that uh, quantitative easing, that would be a misrepresentation of what's really going on. Okay, now I can see what they added. Oh, it wasn't a lot. It's, uh, well, I mean, 200. 
$300 billion. That's what it looks like. But, but what's surprising is, to me, net net, is that, well, that's really great. Well, they're selling the banks and they're buying tech because they kind of don't know what to do. And that's what's going on. We're seeing these very bizarre movements where we're helping the banks, but the banks aren't going up, they're going down. And you buy Apple and Microsoft today. That's the flight to safety again? It's back to the pandemic? Well, Big it, tech is safety? Because, what, but I think this has a lot to do with benchmarking, where they're just punting everything that's outside of the top 15 names in the benchmark, and then just plowing into the high benchmark, high weightings in the benchmark. And we saw this all last year, uh, and to a degree I've never seen before, where the uh, heavy weighted benchmark names generally, unless they had specifically a gigantic problem, they massively outperformed. Mike, you said that last year was one of the like most bearish you've been. Once you see unemployment start picking up, where do you where are you on a relative basis on your bearishness? Well, it, it won't be funny. I'm sorry. It, it, it'll just be funny, and and they'll say the same thing, and that uh, they'll start saying shallow recession after that happens. The Fed will craft a soft landing or something to that effect, and um, and they may or may not be right. But don't worry, they're going to have the utmost confidence in everything they say. And I mean sort of the uh, Wall Street pontificators uh, because they always, you know, their job is to get asset values up. So, you know, always buy, always buy, always buy. So, but what I do know is that if you take a look at the uh, debt to GDP, and this is where something has to go wrong. Uh, the debt to GDP has gone parabolic, just parabolic to a level we've never seen before and and uh, anyone could just google it debt to gdp us debt to gdp and you will see that um we're at a incredibly precarious spot where there's an awful lot of debt versus the gdp that we have so if there is any threat to that gdp and there is uh government spend for next year is probably going to be not as wildly aggressive as this year uh, in part because the cost of capital is so much more, they have to pay about four or five hundred billion dollars more next year just for the coupons on their debt, which is a lot of money. Um, so when you look at that and then you look at jobless claims, what I think they'll, they'll lift. And and then I already look at certain pockets and areas of the U.S. where there is delinquency issues. Um, something we, we're really poised for something bad to happen when you have that much debt to GDP. And, and that's really it, you know, you just try to keep it simple. And then you start drilling down from there and saying, well, what is gonna be affected the most? You know, um, uh, you think business travel is gonna go down and maybe domestic travel and vacations will drop? Well, go after the heavily levered assets, you know, things with a lot of debt uh, in that area, because those equities are probably gonna do the worst. And then you start drilling down, which is the worst of the worst. And that's how you start a, crafting a portfolio. And that way, it's really a top-down metric where you're saying this is what's going to happen in the macro, and the micro won't see it. You know, the micro will see it, meaning the companies will see it last. And that's really because these companies don't have good visibility. They don't know. They don't look at the macro. They don't understand that. Now, by the way, this is a trade that you can use maybe once a decade, okay? So you, this would be my third cycle of doing it. So you have to be lo around long enough to learn how to see it and then how to trade it. And so this would probably be like my first real recession that I can, um, I can trade from a macro know-how point. Uh, so that's kind of exciting. I suppose you could say I've been waiting 24 years for this. <laughs> so, so that just, what does that bet look like? That's that's your long two year treasuries plus you would short companies that you think will get hurt by consumers tightening their belts uh, that have debt. Yeah, that have a lot of debt, um, and that's really it. That's and then you know you keep it dumb. You want to keep it dumb. You want to keep it so that a 12 year old could understand it. 
Um, because if it's any more complicated than that, it might not work. Mike, clearly you're, you're a very sophisticated investor. What should the average person do? I know that you're on Twitter spaces a lot, so you listen. On the long side, uh, how I'm set up, I own the, uh, the two-year uh, treasury in size. It's, I think it's uh, among my top positions, long. Yeah, um, I actually do it through the Simplify family funds. I, I own a product that's managed by Mike Green, um, and the ticker is TUA. And, and that represents something like a short dated bond that's two year or beyond, but less than five year. And so it'll be a sort of mix on what he thinks. So it's actively managed. And that's, uh, and I like that a lot. And I like it in his hands managing it. So, and it's, it's probably the right representation that I have. If you, if you think that the economy is going to slow down, we're going to have a ramp in jobless claims. Well, the two years where you probably want to be, and that's how I've been set up all year. And I was wrong for the first, I don't know, a couple months. And I knew I could be wrong. And I said it, I don't know when it's going to work, but it's going to work this year. And I don't know exactly when, but I think it's in the front half and here we are. So it started, it started to work. But I think that that's on the long side, one of the few assets, if not only assets that has an extremely high probability of um, ascending. So it's not an environment where one can just own the S&P 500 and hold on to it. You know, I, I've never, I, I realize many, many, many investors do that and that's fine. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, look, my entire business and training was to attempt to make money all the time. And I realized that's a full-time job. And most people don't have a full-time job doing this. So, uh, but, but I would say, if you think about a bond and equity portfolio, the bond portfolio part has totally not worked at all for the past 18 months. It's been a cataclysmic disaster. And what I believe is that at least on the short end of the yield curve, it will work. And that if you have a combination of the two year and the S&P, um, you can weather the storm pretty well. So the setup is such that things can break in this environment. You don't have to know exactly what the catalyst will be, but you're positioning yourself for safety. Well, yes, but I never think of it as safety. I don't, I think of it as what asset class do I think will uh, appreciate? That's it. And then I try to find the highest probability um, and, and then size that. And that's really it. So I'm always thinking about, I don't really think about safety or, uh, but, but, I, but I really probably should. So that's a really good point that you brought to me because in the hedge fund world, and that's really where my mindset is, we don't think like that. We think of relative gains. You know, I'm long this, I'm short that. As, they, as the spread occurs, I get to keep the alpha that's in the middle. And that's really how I think. So I don't really think safety or something like that, but I really should because I'll be able to communicate better with the individuals out there. Well, it comes down to the, you know, what makes a great hedge fund manager. You said that it's focusing on not being right, but making money. So that's how you make money. Mike, I like to ask all the inspired money guests, how do you define success? Oh, well, well, one follicle at a time. <laughs> you didn't have to take the hat off. Um, <laughs> uh, there, I would, I would say everyone has a different, a different value for success. Um, but, uh, but I suppose I've, I have been able to look at it perhaps in a different way because I've been able to look at it many times from different vantage points on what success is. And, and for me, uh, success is two, twofold, uh, a job well done while doing the right thing. 
And for me, that's success. So, of course, a job well done means positive returns. So, <laughs> but so there's many fold in there, but it is a job well done and doing the right thing. And that's, uh, that, that's, that's how I get to sleep at night and, um, and, and enjoy life, uh, and not worry about a whole lot. So, uh, I think that that is success. Also being able to not worry about a whole lot. And that doesn't mean being lazy, um, uh, but getting yourself to a spot where you're okay, uh, you don't sweat it. Um, that really is success. And many people never get to that spot in their life. They're, they're sweating it. And there's a lot of adjustments that you have to do to get there. And sometimes it's maybe toning yourself down from the rat race or, um, uh, you know, and, and stepping away from maybe a high pressure situation where you're not happy. Because you might be very successful in the eyes of many, but not terribly happy. And uh, after my experiences, I have a distinct understanding of happiness. And um, I get to reflect back on it. There is no time happier ever than me being on the desk. I loved being on the desk. And I used to have my, my peers would ask me, what's your plan, Mike? When are you going to retire? And I said, are you kidding me? My plan is body bag on the desk. <laughs> that was plan A. I'm not sure about plan B and really, and that's, that's how I felt. And, uh, and I, I enjoy it so much. I just love it. So I'm in a really, really wonderful place doing what I'm doing, working with my, my peers, my, my friends, uh, my contemporaries, uh, and mentoring so many people. Uh, it's wonderful. It's, 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 it's very, um, stimulating and I really enjoy seeing the outcomes. So, so success really is all that wrapped in. And, uh, and I, I hope for you to find that success. And it is, um, it brings an incredible amount of joy if you do it right. It's cool that you can love what you do on your own terms. Well, thank you for sharing your expertise, your insights, your market views, and what you're doing with the pink ETF. That is all very cool. Tell the Inspired Money listeners and viewers where they can follow you and learn more. Oh, sure. You can follow me at uh, Mike underscore Taylor 1972 on Twitter. And you can find me on the Simplify website where they have a description of the pink fund. Um, and I'm frequently a guest on uh, a number of programs, including Hedgeye. Uh, we're doing a new one. Uh, let's see, in May, we have a big powwow up in uh, Connecticut. We're going to get the whole gang together to figure out what's going to happen. I'd love to give you a great prelude for that, but uh, I have no idea what I'm going to say because I'm certain by May, everything will be different. <laughs> so that's what I can tell you is that Whatever I tell you now, I'm wrong. You may have reversed two or three times by Absolutely. then. Absolutely. As I like to say, May, that's seven careers from now. <laughs> so, Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to talking soon. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? I love Mike's passion for investing. He does not shy away from taking big positions or reversing those positions on a dime. I hope you didn't miss what he said about the debt ceiling and how the Treasury's current actions are supporting the stock market. Keep your eyes peeled for cracks in the economy, specifically on commercial real estate, building permits, and jobless claims. My favorite Inspired Money moment was hearing how Mike refocused his life after overcoming health issues. Life is short, so be swift to love and make haste to be kind, and it never hurts to make smart bets in the financial markets. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please post a comment or connect with me on LinkedIn. Before you go, subscribe to my email at inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. Every two weeks, the Runnymead investment team highlights data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm.